Welcome to another episode of the Per 36 Podcast with Simon and today a very special guest, um, Twitter scout and, well I guess not his Twitter scout, uh, but and also Knicks fan, uh, Spencer Perlman. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, I well, feel like it, we should say full just like I, I watch every team. If any team's listening and wants to hire me, not I'm good. only a Knicks fan. You know? Yeah, yeah. No. You, you give you He's you not, give uh, not a homer. He's not not a homer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he has said that through his scouting, the Knicks are the best team in the NBA. <laughs> so scouts, are listening. <laughs> He's your guy. Um. um so, well, I, let's you want to start out? Let's okay. maybe just talk about like what. What is it? So, for twenty nineteen, you I know I know you can't talk about it too much, but you so you did do consulting for the Suns in the twenty nineteen draft, which is last year's draft. Yep. So how? Um, oh yeah, so, how yeah, did you sorry. Well, first like? First, yeah, yeah. I guess. How yeah. did you get involved with that and kind of, um, and then, just kind of the process? I know you can't go into too much, but. So, how I got involved, um, it was really all the video stuff I was doing on Twitter, uh, sending out the detailed reports that I eventually posted, at least like a handful of the ones that I'd done I posted, um, like sending those around to teams and then talking to the right person at the right time. And I hate that I actually said that because it's something that always used to bother me when I would ask someone how they got their job. Um, but it was really just me talking. Um, and then the Suns asked me if I wanted to do it. And then obviously I said yes. Um, and then, yeah, it was a lot of video work. So I was watching games. I was, you know, watching clips. Um, they would ask me for my opinions on on some players, um, like, you know, guys who they should target overseas. Um, not, like, specific to the draft, just guys in general. Uh, and then more draft-specific stuff. Um, be like, you know, who would you – like say, you know, 61st pick in the draft, you know, undrafted free agent. Um, what would be like your top 10, top 10 list of guys you target? And uh, one of the guys I actually gave them was Jared Harper and they ended up signing him. So I'm taking full credit for that, huh. obviously. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of video work and then just, you know, doing what they told me to and giving my opinions on stuff. That's cool. So, but that, that was the main thing. They like took your, uh, like that was the main thing they like used like for sorry that's like the main thing the Suns used uh, from your like advice and stuff like were you responsible for uh, like Cam Johnson or anything in particular what yeah I don't I don't think so um, I mean like there was a group of us working on it and just based on I guess the reports they came out after it seemed like Jeff Boyer was the one who really pushed for Cam because he recruited him coming out of high school um like anyone who's followed me on Twitter and even the people I worked with knew that I had uh, Brandon Clark. Like I loved yeah, him. I yeah. thought he'd be the perfect, like the absolute perfect fit next to um, next to DeAndre Eden. So I was a little bit disappointed when they didn't pick him. Um, but it's nice seeing him do well in Memphis. So, so yeah, I'm that, so happy. That's something Simon and I were just talking about before. And it's just like kind of dumbfounding how, I mean, it's kind of, I guess, back to back years. First, you have uh, Luca. And they have Brandon Clark. Like, how is it that just like people well, pat? I it's mean, two well, different okay, things. Here's the thing. There's also like you say like Luca, but Brandon Clark. But like, this really like this happens every year. Where like over the past few years, like the best players have not been taken in the top four. Like besides like you have like obviously like Luca and Tatum. But like the best players of these past few drafts have been like Shea Gilgis Alexander, Bam. Uh, going back, I mean, I'm just listening Kentucky guys now, but Devin Booker, um, De'Aaron Fox was pick fifth. Like you, you, this, like this, seemingly like people thinking that it's like a lock that you're gonna get a better player in the top five. I actually really hate. I think there's more. I think it's actually easier for me, like in my opinion, to just kind of go with what you think you should, and and in your head be like, oh, I don't want to reach for this person. And it kind of gets screwed. I mean, because, like, think about it. No one was... When we took Knox over SGA, no, no one roasted that move. No one... And I, I mean, I watched a full year of Kentucky basketball, and I loved SGA, obviously, but I was I was excited about Knox. But, like... 
but like what what do you think like leads to just people overlooking like a guy like Clark? Like, I know obviously he was twenty three, but that was a guy that like pretty much was universally by uh, basketball NBA Twitter like to be like good and someone people wanted, and like this is something I saw today like from Draft Express. This like something that's like kind of like ludicrous tweet to me. Uh, this like. Luca has changed the way scouts look at the draft. Analysts are putting more emphasis emphasis on deceleration, prodigious basketball IQ, and productivity now than they did two years ago. Like, it seems kind of crazy to me that like basketball IQ and productivity is not something that was considered as much. Like, what, like what, what's your take on all of that and seemingly easy slip ups like that? Um. So I guess with Luca, like it was pretty clear that anyone who watched him like i don't understand how you could watch what either what he did with his national team or what he did with um with real madrid and you could say oh this guy's gonna he's not gonna be a good player because he literally had everything he could make every single pass in the book he was good off the jump he was good off the off the dribble shooting um finished in the paint really well and like you know people would watch the film i guess and i'd say oh he's not jumping very high but then you you, you watched it and you just saw the craft like you know the side steps, the ability to take bumps and still finish, um, the angles and all that stuff. And I guess people just didn't really like think that that would translate against better athletes. But you know, when you stick your your shoulder to someone, regardless of how athletic that person is, they're going to be pushed backwards, so they're not going to be jumping as high, so he can still get the shot off. Um, so you know, the the lack of athleticism there for some reason just kind of pushed him. Um, behind even though like you know i was sending scouting reports out back then and they're vastly different than what they look like now but uh, i still remember the first sentence is on the, on the luca one um it says like you know the best shooting guard prospect i've seen since brandon Roy, if not Dwayne wade and i put him down as the best international prospect ever like i just didn't think there's any question about it um and then you know i guess he's a little bit different because he didn't really fall that far but someone like clark um he you know he had a thin frame he really wasn't that long and they just they ignored as you know you guys were just saying the basketball iq aspect of it and i think if you if anyone's going to bank on any single skill translating from college to the nba it has to be basketball iq because you can be the least athletic player on the court but if you know where to be and what to do you're probably going to have some sort of positive impact even if it's not even if obviously there are going to be other times where you're you know stuck in your on your heels if someone drives right by you um but Clark had the athleticism too. I think with him, it was just the age because he was turning 23, I think. Yeah. And he didn't really have a jump shot, but the jump shot was an easy projection because he had an unbelievably soft touch. Um, and then, I mean, Knox, full disclosure, I didn't like him. I had maybe him 15th on my board or 14th on my board. Um, like I wanted Herder. I think I had Herder ninth. I, yeah, it's surprising I, in I, retrospect looking through that draft really how Herder didn't go higher. This says like a guy who's a shooter and like a competent defender yeah. and like I mean, this is kind of it's a little bit strange. like uh, not I mean not that similar but like a little bit like Hero this year. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean people thought that um, coming into the draft it was a little bit of a reach. They were just like, oh, he's just a shooter. And then after the summer league, it completely switched to oh, he's a steal. Like yeah, yeah. Of the year candidate. Oh, sorry, uh, but continue if you're. So, yeah, um, no, I mean, I didn't really like Knox. I didn't think he did anything well, just like period, on either side of the ball. He had a soft touch on the floater, but he went, I think he had 72 uh, floaters versus 71 paint attempts, uh, which is a terrible, 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 like, ratio. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's weird because he's 6'9", and uh, he's just that soft, and I didn't really think his handle was that good. It wasn't a playmaker. The shot was streaky, so, you know, you could definitely see that improving, and he had good-looking form. Um but like I was all aboard the Mikhail train, the Herder train. Um, I liked Shea. I just like personally because I I was still fully on board the Frank train, just as I am now, just slightly mm-hmm. different. Um, I wasn't really sure how that fit would work. But seeing as he's fitting in perfectly right now with Chris Paul, you know, I guess I should have um, changed that. <laughs> like I should have viewed that a little bit differently. Um, uh, well, going into this year's draft, what was your take on RJ? Uh, I didn't really think he had any specific skill that you could bank on. That's what we. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what we're kind of saying. We were just talking about like, that before. He's not. I mean, we'll we'll you uh, give more yeah. of a take, but uh, just like I mean, it's something going into the draft, and I mean, I'm not I'm not like necessarily giving up on him. It's just that like the concern with him is he's not really good at like one specific thing in particular besides 
defensive rebounding and as having a guard. like an NBA body like that. Yeah, the, and being strong. It's really uh, all right. Yeah, what 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 were your pre yard pre jacked uh, RJ tips? Uh, I thought you cut out for a sec. Um, yeah, so I mean, as you were saying, I, I just didn't really think he was that great in any specific area. You know, he was very strong. Um, he dislodged guys well, but you know, the shot it definitely needed work. And while there was there was reason to believe he also had a massive like prior sample size of him just not being able to shoot. Um, I thought was, he he is a good passer, especially from the top of the key. But then you know, once he stepped foot kind of inside the three point line, uh, th- see things seemed to move a little bit too fast for him, and the passing kind of went away. Um, like I thought he'd be, I didn't have him as a franchise star, um, somebody you could really bank on and build around uh, a cornerstone. I mean, if he hits his peak, I guess, um, but probably more along like he's a starter. Um, you just kind of like go from there. The defense, I think, actually this year has been better than I expected because I thought the, the lack of um, athleticism, like side to side movement, was probably going to hurt him a little bit, but he's done a good job keeping his hands out in the passing lanes, which he didn't really do all that much at Duke. Um, and then, I mean, you, you can tell he's he's a pro's pro, which like, you really have to love those guys. Like he comes to work and, um, you know, his godfather, Steve Nash. So I'm pretty sure he's probably imparting some good wisdom on him. Um, but I wasn't that high on RJ as a prospect. Uh, I just, it's difficult to, to pick someone that high who's probably not going to make a big impact on either side of the ball. Who was... Uh even looking at the past two drafts, who would you say uh, is the person you you missed completely on? Like, if there's one person that oh, you you completely were like, "Wow, I, I didn't get that right." Yeah. He surprised All me. Right. Or we'll cut or, this part out. Uh, you can yeah. cut this part out if you're sending uh, you know this part to. Scott, so. Yeah, we can get it. Out. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe Mo Bamba. Oh, same. Um, yeah, I, that's a good one. That's a but good one. I, 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 you know, he could still. I mean, I just think it's such a bad fit for him there. I mean, like that, that. Oh that yeah, front it's court, It's like they need to. Tr- they'll, they'll need to trade yeah. someone. No, Mo, Mo was mine too because yeah. I was actually all about in that draft. I mean, I'm not really a draft guy, but it's like, I, I kind of got into like, the stupid eyes from New York, you know. Uh, mm. And he's, I, the he longest spoke so well. ever. Yeah, and yeah, he's like smart and he had a shot and he's like a shot yeah. blocker. It's just yeah, no, I. Obama's Obama's a good a good miss. That's uh like I still like, he's, I think he's actually played better this year than he did last year. And as, yeah. you know, you just said the, the fit's weird because he can't play next to Vooch, and they really don't have a power forward in their team besides Aaron Gordon. And you know, for the first forty games of the season, they're pretty much playing him um, a small forward most of the time. Um, so I Mo, he- like I still think he's going to be good. I'm just. Yeah. And I'm a little bit lower, I guess, now than I was yeah. back then. I wish I wish Atlanta traded for him. That would have been fun. Yeah, I don't know. I, oh, I, Washington I, trade and pop. That would have been nasty. Would have been nasty. I'd, I'd still like, I'd still like to see the Knicks somehow trade for Mobamba. I mean, you know, just take up uh, those games where Mitch fouls out in like a minute. He'll be our Taj. Um, just going back to some things you said, I just kind of agree. I mean, kind of jumping back way back to what you said about like, you know, Luca and just like how you know pushing a guy out isn't going to change like is this like this is something I, I see a lot and it, it's been said as like a drop against zion too even though obviously he's still in what number one just like i think if you're dominant at one level you're not gonna like i think you just got to realize that like if you're dominant at one level even when you're going to the higher level it's not like all of a sudden that's going to completely go away like obviously if you're overpowering college players you're not going to easily overpower nba players but if like you are doing it. Like, it's probably, you're probably still going to be doing it relatively so at the next level, I'd say. I don't know. What do you, what do you do? Yeah. You you need some outlier skill in order to be in that elite tier. So whether it's passing, shooting, um, uh, I guess touch around the rim too, uh, having an unbelievable engine like you know Westbrook does, or just insane athleticism and the ability to use all of it and have it be functional, uh, you, you need something like that. So Zion had that. Um, he like the size, just bowling ball strength, um, unbelievable athleticism. You know, he had the timing. It was it was a really good team defender. I don't really think enough people talked about that. And then, uh, if you went back to some of his high school tape, he was actually taking some guys off the bounce uh, and pulling up from the free throw line for a jumper. And that's something Coach K didn't. I don't think he didn't did it with that. Did it with him that much? But you know, when you're going from level to level, it's 
the guys who have those outlier skills, those are the probably going to be the guys who make the most impact unless if they just have no weakness, period. Now, what was your take on someone like Trey Young? Because that was, I would say, my biggest whiff. I really, I was, I was so not sold on him. I was at the Summer League uh, for his first game, which I'm pretty sure was against the Knicks. And mm-hmm. he played horrendously. Um, and I've I've had to eat my words, and he's he's obviously been a great player with those outlier skills you're talking about. Um, but what was your take on him coming in? Uh, so that was before I really got to the outlier, the outlier kind of like view where you need those elite skills. Like I loved the passing. I thought the passing was insane. I thought the shooting was really good. Um, but at the same time, I was very very worried about his size and his defensive limitations and how that would negatively impact just how effective like uh, how much he's able to impact the game i mean i uh, i still don't think that's necessarily like unfair to say i mean like he's still like pretty much uh, ranked as one of like the worst defensive players in the league and like the hawks are like one of the worst teams so like i think it's honestly you know i think all i mean i think that concern's still yeah. fair i mean obviously he's starting the all-star game but i mean and you know, I, I wouldn't say he's bad. I just, I mean, I don't know. That's that's not even like really. Uh, he's just probably not conducive to winning right now. Yeah, yeah, but it'll be a question of like how conducive to winning he can be. I don't know. No. I think he needs he needs a specific team around him. So again, going back to Brandon Clark, um, my dream draft for Atlanta would have been you know DeAndre Hunter or Cam Johnson. Not sorry, uh, Cam Reddish. Not both of them. That was odd. And then someone like Clark. Um, like he needs strong wing defenders next to him. I prefer someone else who can play a little bit of you know point or handle the ball a little bit more. Um, but I, I do kind of think Trey's been a little bit screwed by the team around him. Like I, I think that if he actually had guys who could more consistently knock down shots besides really hurt her, um, his impact would be a little bit better. But the defense is like you can routinely target him, and whether it's just a screen, he'll die in the screen. He's obviously not switchable because he's. You know, 6'2", 185 pounds, probably like 175 pounds. Um, and, yeah, like I, I still think Trey's very good. I still kind of think that the defense is going to be a limiter. Because um, even someone like Steph, you know, Steph early on in his career wasn't a great defender, but he was not anywhere near this bad. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it'll be interesting to see if uh, the results in them training – John Collins because he's you know kind of a liability yeah. too. I don't know if you could really like build around both. Yep. Maybe uh you know they'll give. Him I'd actually money. trade John because he's going to end up getting a max contract or close to it, and he's not going to be worth it. Like yeah. I would, I would trade him now. <laughs> I would have traded him for. I, I was, I, I was. We just, had, yeah. I would trade him for Bomba at the deadline. Yeah, up. he's always, uh, he's always very easy to trade for in two K. In two K, it's always, always the move to trade for John Collins, and he's going to be like a yeah. ninety overall in a few years. But uh, in real right. life. I don't. I don't know. So, I mean, J.R. Smith and Steve Novak were pretty unstoppable during TK. Also, yeah, true. true. J.R. is <laughs> like Steve Novak was actually a cheat code. But, um, J- yep. J.R. is pretty, probably the biggest two K cheat code ever, just because he has a two. You know, as a two K draft expert, there's two skills you need. You need to be able to shoot and you need to be able to dunk, and J.R. can do, do both of those. An elite yeah. skill, making him like so he truly a ninety nine overall. He has the like, that's, skills. that's how I draft in two K. You go to you go to dunk rating, you go to three point rating, you sort by top. J.R. Smith, he's he's in now the one pick of the two K draft. Just scoop him up. Yeah. Um Spencer, so when looking towards this this year's draft, um I wanna get your take on this. Um the guys that I want for the Knicks are like it's it's not the most popular rankings um but if i if i had to choose my top six prospects this year it's gonna be Lamelo, killian hayes anthony edwards isaac okoro uh tyrese mm-hmm. maxi and then halliburton and i just want to know what you think about some of those guys especially some of the guys who haven't been getting as much media attention such as uh maxi and okoro um and then maybe get your your opinion on a guy like Cole Anthony who I I believe right now is being overrated by the media but um so I like the list um I think Halliburton out of all of them might be 
the most difficult fit though because next to rj you you want someone who's really going to get into the paint and put some pressure on the defense um outside of just you know running the pick and roll and, like halliburton's an unbelievable passer like unbelievable passer I just finished up watching every pick and roll he ever ran um a huge number of like offensive clips so the passing is there with him it's just he had like i think 30 half court finishes um that's you know he's got great touch like really really good touch but in order to open up those shots on the perimeter you want someone who's going to be putting yeah. some sort of pressure at the rim and i don't think he can really do that um but i love his game like such a fun smart very 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 smart player max um yeah that's what i was gonna go to next um because i don't know if i like the fit with him either honestly that's fair i mean in terms of him are you sold on him as a prospect in general not with the knicks but are you have you gotten to that point where you think he's a a, like a real all-around prospect are you still the jury's still out I think he's a two-way player. Um, and like, I think he's a very good defender. It's you know, point of attack. Uh, he's quick, though not super, super quick. He's, I think he's pretty long. He's got like a six-eight wingspan, which will definitely help him at point guard. Um, pretty strong, so he might have some ability to defend some smaller twos. But he's not a playmaker. Yeah. Um, I, I don't trust him running an offense. Um, and the shot, though it's been in- inconsistent this year, I do think he's a good shooter. It's just. You know, you want someone who's going to get into the paint and be able to pass. Like, if you combined him with Halliburton, that would be that would be like a pretty good player who would want next to RJ. But because Maxi, he can't play point. I don't really think you want RJ running the offense full time, and I definitely don't want Alfred Payton running so, the offense next full time. Even though um, Alfred Payton is an elite defender, if you just simply you got to look at the baseline view. <laughs> exactly. About, Ignore everything else too. <laughs> um, what about a guy like like Killian Hayes, who hasn't really got, like? I mean, he, you can hear it start to heat up now in terms of the hype, but there wasn't really much about him earlier. Everyone was really like hyped about Cole and Lamelo. Um, yeah. So I was really happy about this because back in November I sent out a tweet saying like buy him as a top five player, and now he's you know top three or four I think on most people's boards. Um, I love the passing, like unbelievable left-handed passer. I think he's a good fit next to RJ. He doesn't, he's not going to break someone. He's not going to break someone down in isolation um, and gets the rim, but he's really, really good attacking the rim off pick and rolls, um, which, you know, it's definitely going to help. And then his ability to pass while he's going downhill, he can make every pass in the book. That, that's like awesome. And his defense, he's got some positional versatility because he's 6'5", he's almost 6'9", wingspan. He's pretty strong, and I think he can definitely get a little bit stronger. Um, and then the shot, he's a, he's a 90% free throw shooter, I think. And then, you know, catch and shoot, it hasn't really been very good to him. But, you know, the form, aside from being a little bit low, um, it, it's pretty conducive to at least catching and shooting. He's not going to be a movement shooter, but... Like I fully expect him to be a thirty-six to thirty-eight percent three-point shooter at the least. Right. Um, yeah, I like the fit. And then Okoro, uh, just really quickly, I'm finishing up my report on him. That's hopefully going to be out uh, tomorrow, so the seventeenth, I guess, when we're recording this now. Um, he's actually someone who I'd probably love as a fit next to, to RJ, um, especially because I don't think the Knicks are going to be doing particularly well next year. So high in the lottery. But maybe you could get Cade, and then you could oh, have that, Cade, that RJ, and Akora as a one, two, three. Uh, I can't get too excited about that. But uh, I mean, Akora, he's unbelievable defender. His footwork is like it's fantastic, and he's built like a rock. So again, the positional versatility. I think his passing is actually legitimately good. It's just Auburn, for some reason, uh, Bruce Pearl refuses to use him more as a creator, um, and. Yeah, I mean, I I love Akora. He's he's probably he was I guess probably closer to you know seven eight on my board. Um, now I'm pretty sure he's firmly in the top five or so. Uh, who's your, like just looking in on one? Who's your uh, who's your number one prospect? It's Lamelo. It's Lamelo. I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sold on I'm, so, I'm sold on him too, but yeah. you have to have some some worries in terms of just. Um, him defending and his shot clicking. Yeah, so the the team defense I I'll probably buy in the long term because 
you normally can't make plays and be so instinctual on one side of the court and just be bad on the other side. So I think with him, a lot of it's just kind of effort because there were some plays that he was making, like rotating on the basket or on the basket rather. And then like he rotated well along the perimeter, um, contested shots, helping he was supposed to. So I do buy that. And then even on ball, like he's got quick hands. Um, I think he's got pretty quick feet when he's actually in his stance. It's just, you know, he has to stay in the stance. Um, and then the shot, you know, the percentages aren't good, but if you look at the team around him, he, he, you know, he didn't really have much help, I guess, around him. So if you pull in the shot selection a little bit, um, tweak the form a little bit too. Like I think he's, I think he's a stud. Um, it's funny though, because like I've had him, I've had Killian at one. I started the season with Edwards at one. Um, it's a were weird you, draft. It's, were you always a little? Um... Did you were you always a little hesitant uh, about a guy like uh, Cole? Yeah, let's let's, just, let's start the Cole Anthony yeah. Rose set. Because I've so I've I've been I've seen Cole play basketball since we were eight years old. Um, and yeah, since they <laughs> since they won a Knicks game, we just they we Knicks saw game. we saw he wasn't you know we saw he wasn't top five. Well, I'd say he was with Cole team. not really being uh you know I'm not really a scout, but I will say watching him outside of the fact that like he's inefficient. And like not good in college, which I don't like, as something carrying over to the NBA where it's harder to be good and efficient. Um, that he doesn't, I don't think he gets into paint that much, which I think is a concern. Like, you know, he has a little bit of noxitis. You know, if you can't get to the rim against, uh, you know, the little fellas, I don't know you can do that against the big guys. And also, random I, point, not really a real point though, just about Knicks camp. I just realized the other, the other day that Cole Anthony at Knicks camp. He went up. He was like he played with the older guys. Yeah. He was in like the NBA division. Well, we'd be in like whatever. Well, still be like the college division, whatever. And now we're sophomores in college, he and was he's my, he's a yeah, freshman in college. So was, I guess he, we're better than him because we uh we're not we're not. He, he's the one stepping got, down to age level now. I don't know if I got called up or he got brought down, but he was on my team for our uh, our championship run. Oh, and oh god, we got that chip and. Oh. I uh, he he. There was a game though when he cried for uh, not getting the ball enough. There yeah. were tears. Yeah. There so tears. do you think? I guess the question is. I mean, I wait, wait. We're <laughs> that. In watching, especially in the tape, so he was out for a while with a knee injury. He comes back and everyone's like, "Okay, UNC is going to turn it on now." And then they go, I think, zero and four or zero and five with him, and he's just having these games where he's like six for twenty four, just really just 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 chucking it i want to know what your kind of take is on it as it leads into draft yeah you're allowed to not yeah, have a disdain for him yeah, like we yeah. have decided to do for no reason for no you know, absolutely should, no reason you know, he's probably be rooting him on to be like oh yeah, yeah we, we did next game with it. <laughs> yeah no it's it's but uh yeah what's what's your take well the Knicks camp thing is interesting because like someone at who I talked with on Twitter, he messaged me saying that a coach texted him and he said that Cole Anthony isn't a winner. Yeah, he's not, yeah, he's not a winner. He's a 10-year-old Cole Anthony. He cried. He's not a winner, And man. And all he does is complain. All he used to do is complain to the refs. He As a not... 12-year-old, he would just complain. Yeah, yeah. I, I just remember like thinking he was a uh, jerky McJerk face. Yeah, no. It's... He, he just doesn't, you know, not not a team play. You know, as my scouting report for as a 11-year-old, just not a team player. It's not. is not. Doesn't have the intangibles. Uh, where would you where would you slot him in on your board? Uh, he he's probably towards the back end of the second tier, so he's probably closer to seven, I guess. Um, like I, I have Denny above him, I have a core above him, yeah. uh, I have a Kungu above him, I think, and then yeah. uh, I think Cole is probably mm-hmm. there. Uh, Halliburton's right there. Just kind of depends on what team you have, um, but like you know the inefficiency. Obviously, there are definitely some concerns, um, but. The inability to get into the paint. I mean, oh, I may be wrong about that. I don't know. Is that? I don't know. Yeah, like no, he can he can penetrate. Like that's his. All right, I don't know if I. I may be talking out my uh, rear end. Yeah, you might uh, not be. (laughs) No, I think I think with him, a lot of it is pretty much UNC's system, and Rory Williams has pretty much given him full slate to do whatever he wants. Clean slate. You you know, chuck thirty footers. You could pull up 17 footers with 24 seconds left in the shot clock he doesn't care um because their offense is pretty much trying to get the offensive rebound and beating guys in the glass and uh he he has no other perimeter talent 
um, in terms of shooters like Christian Keeling was supposed to come in and be that, you know, the floor space and he's shot 20 something percent, I think from three this year. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to get to the paint and you have, you have guys who you can just ignore in the perimeter, they can just focus entirely on you. That's definitely making finishing a lot harder. It's making getting to the, you know, the rim a lot harder. Um, so I don't really think that part is entirely his fault. I think if anything, maybe his inability to see passing lanes, uh, cause that's something that only happens a lot when he drives. Um, that's something that has to be worked on, but you know, UNC that they're forcing him to be a major score cause they have no other perimeter player who can do that. And Cole is someone who can play on and off ball. So like, if you have someone, and I, this is probably a cop out, but someone like Luca who can just run the offense, um, and you could have Cole playing off ball, running around screens, catching and shooting, attacking guys off the bounce, you know, coming off a of curl and uh, rolling. Um, I think that's a good fit. And then I think he's got a pretty, maybe not safe floor, um, but I can easily see him being, you know, a, a pretty high level six man scorer. Um, he's just not someone who you want running an offense full time. Like you need other uh, perimeter playmakers around him other passers i guess um just pr- to bring it back to the knicks a bit like what what's your take on i guess like how players have developed this year and like what you know your concern level or just like what what do you think about the, this current group of guys because right now i'm just like a little skeptical i mean rj again despite not being good at anything uh i'm not that overly concerned just because i know he does have that work ethic i just i don't know i mean he, he is concerning but he's just like not the least like not the biggest concern is this that like dennis smith and knox is this like i don't I don't know it's just like i just feel like none of the young cores really Mitch needs to get it, yeah like it seems now. like the best the best the best prospect on our our, our roster right now is mm-hmm. mitchell robinson who's like a poor man's <laughs> like he at times i don't i don't know what's your what's your take on the young knicks core and their ceiling and I don't know. <laughs> so Knox, um, he has to become a big time three point shooter, I think, in order for him to really have any sort of positive impact on the team. Even then, it's not like you know he'll be some version of like a much worse Tobias Harris. Um, yeah, I, my comparison for him is like Jabari Parker light, light, which is not yeah. not good. <laughs> it's not. Uh, you wanna? Yeah, but like Dennis. I mean, that's, I guess, the kind of weird one because he came out of college with a hitch in his shot and then the hitch just got progressively worse and then he had issues playing off ball with Luca, and there were clashes there, I think, with Rick Carlisle also. But Carlisle, when players don't listen to him, he's, he, you know, he doesn't, like, put him in the doghouse, but he gives him a shorter shorter leash, I guess. Yeah. Um, and he's an unbelievable coach. Like, he's easily one of my five favorite coaches, coaches to watch. So I don't blame him, and I trust everything he does. Um but in terms of development with the Knicks, like he's pretty much been not playable. So, you know, if you can't shoot and if you can't really finish despite your athletic ability, it's pretty hard to give consistent minutes. And then someone like Frank, I, I feel bad for because like you've seen the flashes when he's played point and he's been given like a string of good 25 minute a game, you know, games uh, sorry for being redundant but like he's he's shown the ability to like you know he's, he's a really good pick and roll passer he's yeah. not chris paul or luca but he's a really good pick and roll passer and with him it's just the jump shot and i'm still buying it even if the results haven't been there um i want to see him get a little bit more aggressive still and be given more responsibility on ball um then mitch I feel like he's kind of stagnated and yeah. he's the exact same player he was last year. And I, honestly, I don't really think he's going to change much as, I mean, he, he'd have to become some sort of passer on the short roll, um, maybe shoot a little bit. And I don't think he's going to shoot. Um, then his, his thin frame makes him very difficult to play against the guys like Jokic and Embiid and like Nurkic, you know, the guys who are above 200 and 25 pounds even because Mitch is just thin with high hips and yeah. thin frame. Uh, who's the other one? RJ, I mean, I'm not worried. He's a rookie. I just yeah. really wanted to see some progressions from last year and his shot, it's looked good. 
It, it, well, it looks better than last year. We'll go with that. And the yeah. fact that he's shooting, you know, okay, I think from three, um, from NBA three, that's a good sign. The defense has been a little bit better. Yeah, I'm, I'm he's actually never, like, not too I concerned mean, about his I, shot. I'm thing, honestly more concerned that he's been like literally the worst finishing player in the NBA. Though again, he is a 19 year old rookie, and it is a weirdly spaced team. And also, like when it like, when it comes to Frank, I think the part that's hardest for us frank supporters to accept is like and what we know it's true and inevitable is like we're not going to see the true frank blossom until like he's inevitably not on the team anymore. <laughs> yeah and like <laughs> until <Antonio. it's> <laughs> yeah i was literally just about to say like once he goes to the spurs or yeah or the or the wherever really like I mean, he, he's gonna go to a good western conference team and people the, are gonna realize and it's gonna be really painful frank is the human cockroach like somehow he just survives every regime he survives like every um, like veteran point guard they throw in front of him for no we reason. Have, we at have all. the most fickle fans in the world, and like like the most like easy to turn, and everyone lo- like I mean he he can do no wrong. Like yeah, he, I, I think he can do no wrong. I I just I don't know I I don't know I, it, I'm, it, the I'm whole still, the whole Frank thing is so weird the way he's become like the villain when he's like again like I said the other day like he's like the one player who's been here all this time that's actually kind of shown some improvement and is at least good at defense and. I don't. I don't know. He's far from the like, problem. The annoying thing with Frank is that even on defense, like he might not be getting seven steals in the game, like Alfred Payton. And this, I think, is kind of where where some people are missing it. Is there's positional defense too. So you want someone smart enough to when there's a strong side pick and roll, and Frank's playing on the weak side, you want him to play the pin, and he plays the pin really well. Like you know, being able to tag the roll then get back. Uh, get back he knows how to rotate along the perimeter that's the stuff that's not going to show up in the box score and if you're not actually looking for it or if you're only watching the ball you're going to miss it and i think just in general many casual fans in the nba they just kind of miss that stuff and i mean i can't really blame them because they're not trained or you know it's not really something that they've ever been pointed out to look for um so i think that's that's i guess why some why there's some disconnect between like the so-called frank fans and then uh, the non-Frank fans is that the Frank fans are maybe seeing a little bit more of that, um, and the non-Frank fans are just kind of wondering, you know, he's not scoring. Uh, what's the deal? Yeah, no, I, I I get that, and I'd say the other thing that's frustrating with Frank, which I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a bit uh, of a stretch, but it's also just like it's just unfortunate because he always seems like he th- this season in particular he's had like stretches where he finally is like on offense kind of getting it a bit more where he maybe is getting his legs under him a bit more and like making threes and being more aggressive and then like all of a sudden i feel like he just gasses out or he his groin his gives groin, out yeah. his freaking groin he's gotta yeah. take it easy uh, <laughs> but uh yeah but yeah i don't know maybe so, but and, and then with uh mitch the thing yeah i, I just say he's honestly been disappointing I, I don't even care about the jump shot which again is still kind of annoying how that was his main thing this summer which really didn't need to be his thing and then all he's talking about is like ah oh, i'm gonna shoot it and then he just didn't even take one in preseason or whatever mm-hmm. um but honestly it, it's not even I, I don't even need to see him shoot a jumper he just has such unreal athleticism and like you know he's best buddies with the ad i would just love to see him like once just like face up and like rip through and just like try to i mean it's not really an easy thing to do but that that's really something more i'd like to see this use it's like speed as an advantage and try to like take players off the dribble i mean i have seen it like once or twice a season that that's really what i think could be his what given what could give him an extra thing on offense i mean that's really not an easy thing for a center to dribble i'm just saying like that it's just disappointing to see him just as yeah. a, a rim runner because i know he could be so much more i mean he shows a lot of skill on some of his finishes and he's just so fast I don't know. And his yeah. arms are like gadget arms. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, I guess, the point in the season where teams who are not in the running for the playoffs is the Knicks are not. They need to start shifting towards the development, so they should be encouraging someone like Mitch to maybe try something he probably wasn't... Or he was told he shouldn't try earlier in the season, or um, you should tell Frank, like, you know, go take 10 shots. Like, go do that. Tell Mitch tack the room a little bit more give rj some more responsibility like you want these guys to to feel more comfortable um and 
try to expand their game later in the season, if it, even if it's not going to be their role next year. Why not try it if you're literally playing for nothing but development? That's like, a try great to develop. It's a great question, but instead they're literally going in like the opposite direction. Giving minutes to Wayne Ellington. Mm-hmm. It's not even just giving the minutes. It's that like Knox when he plays literally has no become confidence. like a defensive specialist, which really isn't like the role for Knox, who's like not good at defense, and is coming his yeah, his calling true. card is like, his offense. Oh, but, and Alfred Payton in the past fifteen games has literally had like a usage that like rivals LeBron James. Well, like, it's like this is what is the point? Also, like last year when they were in the quote-unquote development stage um, and Knox was basically getting all of these gimme minutes. Like, let's say he was getting 30 minutes a game, 33 minutes a game, when obviously his play didn't earn it. But, like, and towards the... When this year started and Fisdale really made it clear that he was going to have to earn his minutes, we were like, okay, we get that. He shouldn't have been playing as much last year. This might be better, help make him more efficient. But, like... I'd really like to see him out there instead of Reggie Bullock. I mean, like, just to know what we have. Because that's the biggest issue. Well, is yeah, the that's, like, that's... It takes so much time for them to figure out what they have, and then they still don't do a good enough job. Yeah, really I mean, it. I guess we're going to a whole other thing here, which is it could be, like, a whole other podcast in itself. It's, like, in the development season, when you suck, and newsflash, it's been known the Knicks suck since, like, 10 games in. Like, it shouldn't have taken... It shouldn't be that the last three weeks, which they're not even using, should be the time you start developing players. This should be all season. I mean, again, the whole stick that, like, Dotson and Frank have a positive net rating, like, not just, like, better than usual, but, like, they're literally, like, winning points when those two are on the floor, and, like, they've played, like, such few minutes in their three years. It's just, like... Development is not the time to see what you have when you suck and you have a de- you're in a development season. The time, this is not the time to see what you have in veterans like Alfred Payton and Reggie Bulk have been in the league for years, so you know I'm what counting, they are. I'm counting. It's not to see who they are. Too. I'm counting him as a vet. Yeah, this this is the time to be seeing what you have in these guys. Like it's just, yep. I don't know. It is it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um. I mean, I don't know why they're playing Ellington. I don't know why they're playing. I mean, even someone like Dennis, I don't really think there's much hope left for him, as sad as that is. Uh, but he has a lot to still learn. There's it's really inexcusable that, like, why are you playing Taj Gibson, you know, Julius Randall, all these guys, 30 minutes a game? Uh, I don't understand that either. And you can't say it's like because it's a winning culture when. It's like a maybe at best a minimal improvement as they're. I mean, they're literally like sixteen and thirty-seven. But I don't know, Spencer. If you, I, I was on a, on Twitter the other day. A fellow named Tommy D told me I was just missing everything because I wasn't. I didn't have the right angle. I need to watch from the baseline angle. Is it true that I believe what he listed were passing angles, pick and roll angles, and among many other things, are among. things you can only see from the baseline that you can't see from the sideline. Do you disagree or agree with that take? Uh, I disagree that you can only see it from the baseline. Like, if honestly, the best view is above everything. So you can literally see every possible thing. It's a 2K thing, view. But also, what? The, the 2K angle, that's, that's the best view. Yeah. Yeah, like, I think that's a great view, even if it's kind of not fun when you're watching uh, just to watch. I think that's a great angle. But you can still easily see where someone was supposed to rotate or you know if someone missed a passing lane just because you can you can see it like there's no specific place you have to be and then if you're in another place you're wrong and that's the incorrect place like that opinion is is wrong (laughs) (laughs) yeah i I just i just don't get how people like come out for like the fourth straight season pretty much i guess with the exception of last year a little of just like playing veterans and just like like i just don't know how you if you could still be the still be defending it like and still be happy to see like Alfred Payton play 35 minutes a game like was Jarrett Jack and uh Jose Calderon and this all these guys is like did not contribute to any like they again like it's been like four straight seasons of just like roster overturn of like vets who provide nothing and don't contribute to anything and then dipping like all, well, all they provide is just like hurting the pick the one continuous thing the Knicks could have had from like the Luka. past three seasons Luka. Well, yeah, but I'm saying like what they've actually had on the roster is Dotson and Frank, which for no reason has like not even played like a thousand total minutes in three seasons. It's just like 
ridiculous. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, we could about wrap things up with the last thing we like to do, which is uh, talk about, um, you know, it is a Per 36 podcast, so we like seeing the Per 36 All-Star. I mean, it doesn't have to be a Per 36 All-Star. Spencer, do you have, like, a favorite, like, Knicks – well, not really Nick scrub. Just, just, yeah, just any uh, favorite NBA scrub. But not even a just so, or someone that just you think in th- in three years could be. Uh, but, I don't know. This, this is yeah. like an underappreciated player. An you know? underappreciated player. It's uh, uh, you know, like a ho- uh, like a well, me, Pablo yeah. or Chris Copeland or you know, it doesn't have to be a Nick. Chris Copeland. Uh, yeah, give me a give me a couple. Give, give me a minute here. Yeah, I'm gonna no worries, pull no. a basketball reference and see what I can get. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Uh, In the meantime, I'll just continue ranting about the Knicks. I just, I just truly don't understand how people could just like. It, it's literally been like five straight seasons where like it's. I mean, like I, I just don't know how you could defend like being happy with this version of like not tanking and not. Uh, not competing either. like I'm not even saying the tank just like just play the young guys like nothing literally it's been I mean obviously it's just like in general some improvement but within the Knicks itself it's like clearly the, the the way to go is not these like fake playoff teams where it's like all vets and then like the rookies and young guys barely playing like in 2014-15 we finally like kind of actually tanked 17 game 117 games Got Porzingis. And then next year, like, all right, that's it. We're done. Then the next three years was just, like, half-ass playoff runs to the point in which led to nothing but Frank and Knox because they had a mediocre pick. And then, like, that led to Porzingis getting fed up because he didn't want to wait mediocre that long. And now 17 wins the next season. Got RJ. And then all of a sudden it's, like, the same thing where there's, like, I trying know. to build, like, a half-ass that's playoff ha- team. That's how we, that's thankfully, how we are. Thankfully it, it's going to fail and they're going to get a – the great Lamelo Ball CAA client, but just like, I don't know. I I, just, I, just, I don't know how the how Knicks fans could have watched so much of the same thing every year and debate it again. I tweeted out before the season starts. It's like every year it's the same debate I still of whether that. to tank or whether to go to eight seed, and they do neither. And it's not even about tanking. It's just like again, I just don't understand the. The, the, the what the benefit is of playing it's these guys that are have, like going to be off the team in a not, year or like out of the league in a year boot, it's there is no benefit they just don't have any clear plan so it's like we we can't stop looking for ways to rationalize it when it's not like they're this is their master plan they're just not yeah that organized okay. yeah all right do you have a do you have a man yeah um i'm just gonna keep this simple i couldn't really find anyone else i'm i'm just gonna say frank again like i honestly yeah. think he's gonna end up being traded by the knicks at some point he's gonna end up going to a good team and even if he's just playing like an alex caruso role alex caruso is oh. valuable to the lakers yeah that's and that's what that's what i was saying the other day i mean alex caruso is pretty much and again to a lot of people <laughs> that's gonna be something they don't want to hear but alex caruso is like a very good example good of what Frank could be, and right now he's yeah. he's about to be twenty six. So that's like, you know, Frank's Frank's only uh, twenty one right now. So he, in four in five years, he could be you know a better version of Alex Caruso, who and Caruso right now he like has been one of the most impactful players on the Lakers. Like a few nights ago, he had like the highest plus minus on the team. Like he he's genuinely like an impactful player, and like. So yeah, I mean, is is this like kind of like a measurement of like what you think about like it's kind of a weird it's just a weird thing where you look at a guy like Alex Caruso, you look at a guy like Frank, just nothing pops out, but they're genuinely like impactful players. And Frank in six years, I mean five years, could easily when he's Caruso's like could easily be like, <laughs> I mean, I maybe you know like I don't know, it's it's a weird it's a weird thing, like, you know, a player like. Saying be, Frank, saying Frank, Frank could be Frank, the next Alex Caruso no, isn't really something could be that the, haters would wanna Frank, really kind of prove their point. But like, Frank he could, could be, be a better Caruso. Frank could be better than Gary Harris, and I still haven't given up. Yeah, I don't. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, uh, right. I t- uh, two quick ones. We what? Uh, two, two last quick ones. One uh, of them's Chuma Okiki, who I loved last year at Auburn. Good. That's and then a, yeah, Gr- Grant good. Williams, because like he's Grant Williams. He, he's just a fun big to watch. And, wait, and just just to confirm. Um, Okiki signed that 
that kind of weird deferred deal with the Magic, right? To where he uh, he waited a year to sign. I'm pretty sure because they they drafted yeah, he, they drafted him first round, but I don't think he signed a deal yet. But uh, to yeah, no, he's doing the uh, what's it called? Um, it's he essentially, said it's or whatever. I don't know. Oh, he said he'll sign a G League contract for the season and then his NBA rookie deal in the 2020 off season. Wow, that's interesting. That I'm surprised is more players don't do something like that. Yeah, it's like a red. But uh, anyway. Frank, you know, there's two stats that matter in con- making a basketball player to me, and it's on off and ESPN's real plus minus. But uh, just looking at on, well, I think Russo is like top 25 in RPM, but so Frank is number one on the Knicks in on off, like plus minus per 100 possessions, and Caruso is second on the Lakers behind LeBron James, like, you know, and also third is Javale McGee, who's uh, future mitts. Ninth is Amber so, Rose. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I think Frank. I think a good comparison for Frank is perhaps becoming a better Alex Caruso, which I mean, this kind of depends on uh, your your takes on uh, basketball. I have one question. For All right, yeah. yeah. Well, just before we close it, I just want to get your opinion on uh, Leon Rose and that switch from agent ranks to front office. I mean, I, from what everything that I've read, from everything I know, he's a very like he's very smart. He knows how to get the right people around him. Um, you know, he's an intelligent negotiator based on the stuff he's done with his clients. Um, I don't really know like how easy the transition to go from being an agent to a front office executive is going to be because you're going from one side of the negotiating table to the other. Um, but like assuming that the intelligence kind of carries over and I don't see why it wouldn't and his openness to working with like the right people uh, carries over, and I think that will. I think it could actually be pretty good. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm really trying to be optimistic about it. Yeah, I mean, essentially, my take on the whole thing is just that, like, CAA stink has been all over, like, pretty much every bad thing to happen to the Knicks in, like, the past, like, decade. And obviously, now that they're working for the Knicks, not against them, they're working for good instead of evil. But it's just hard for me to imagine that, like, especially with. Uh, Wild West, um, not w- actually with them. It's just hard for me to imagine they're really just like not going to value their agents anymore and really put the team first fully. I don't know. I, I mean, I also just like again, just in the NBA, I think right now it's so much more important now than ever. Like as teams are getting smarter to find like a new ingenious way to like pull ahead and just like getting an agent to do that instead of like I don't know, just trying to find some like friggin nerd or something like <laughs> hinky or someone like him to to do that just like just screams not the move to me I don't know. if if i can say one thing yeah. um i think i think it's important to note that rather than trying to get the better of a team now he's trying to get the other side so his success is entirely dependent on how the knicks do and like if, if he has to shun caa people in order to improve the knicks I think he will because it's a you know job security and all that and b as everyone says if you do own new york you're gonna be a god um and going from one of the biggest agents basically just just by the fact that his his job security and how successful he is will be entirely entirely dependent on the decisions he makes as you know the head of the knicks so i think it's i think it's safe to to assume that you know, he won't bring in someone, he won't sign someone who might be from CAA just because he's from CAA if that player, you know, either wants too much money or could negatively impact the Knicks. Yeah, I mean, that, that's fair. Just That's just one concern I have. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, really more so it's that, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I really, my more concern is just that, like, I don't know, I, I, just, I just would rather have had a guy that has had more experience yeah. like that that's really more it's just to jump from agent to gm but anyway i think we could about wrap up um so spencer do you want to just plug your stuff uh your twitter sure. and what have you yeah so you guys can find me at twitter at sk perlman i'm constantly putting out uh videos although i guess that's kind of taking the back seat now except for when i'm actually writing the reports um and my scouting reports that i'm always tweeting and retweeting uh, those can also be found on my Twitter account and then also at the Stepian. And 
Yeah, I mean, hopefully I'm not doing this much longer and a team hires me, so <laughs> get yeah, him like, and I guess. Respect. And then, respect. And then the well, clout from having him on the podcast would be. Yeah. Then it all oh, pays oh, off. Oh, we had legendary Nick off. Scout, Scott, uh, Spencer Perlman, who chose LaMelo Ball at the first pick after uh, st- after Stephen Stout reached out to him. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Um, all right, well, we'll definitely check back in again. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Uh, you 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 said a lot of interesting things, and uh, hope to talk to you again in the future. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.